Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it gives me much pleasure to introduce to you uh, Mr. Donington, who is going to give us an address uh, uh, with regard to the early history of uh, Fort Belfort. Mr. Driffield, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> I'm going to give a short talk on the history of Fort Belfort as gleaned from my great-great-grandmother's diary, which <clears throat> this part that I have here is dated from 1873 to 1884. Now, the unfortunate part about this is that the first part of the diary was destroyed. <clears throat> it was destroyed by my great-aunt Fanny Dorrington, for this simple reason that uh, the names of uh, <coughs> the Reverend Dorrington's wife's children were recorded in the first part of this diary. And one day, when Aunt Fanny came down in the parlor in the old, old house in Fort Belfort, she found one of her nieces reading this diary, and of course she found that the, her niece had found out how old she was. So she immediately took the diary and burned it. <laughs> now, <clears throat> the peculiar, what strikes me as peculiar about these people that we're going to talk about tonight is that <clears throat> the, 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 the ladies were terribly subservient to their husbands. Uh, for instance, she never mentions her husband's name at all in this diary. <clears throat> it is either Papa or Mr. Dorrington. It's not like my wife, she's got a couple of names for me, <laughs> according to my peculiarity. <coughs> they were indeed peculiar people, as I would like to illustrate. I once heard my grandmother describing about a family that she knew, <coughs> or had heard talked about in the Bedford district. Uh, it was a husband and wife, I won't mention any names here, and uh, they had a <clears throat> they went on speaking terms. Uh, they had a great big yellow wood table in the dining room and when they had their meals, the husband would sit on the one side and the wife at the bottom there and he would send messages to her through the children. <laughs> and this carried on for about 11 years. But <laughs> what intrigues me is that they managed to raise a family during that time. They raised a blessing. <laughs> Now, <clears throat> the diary is actually written by Marion Dorrington, and she was born Kerr. Her father was the second son of the Marquis of Lothian. The Marquis of Lothian, of course, was Roman Catholic, and she fell in love with a Protestant. And she was determined to marry him, so <clears throat> she had to renounce her faith and marry this Protestant. Well, he had two children, that was John and Marion. Uh, John was an old bachelor, he went off to Australia when they found gold there, and uh, we lose such, uh, touch with him. And I believe he, ever, he eventually came back to South Africa, or joined the family, and he farmed somewhere up in the Winterburg. Uh, Marion, Marianne, I should say, M-A-R-I-A-N-N-E, -N -N -E, in the name is, she married <coughs> this uh, Presbyterian, or she, he wasn't actually a Presbyterian, he was a Congregational Minister. He took his MA at Oxford in theology, and I started off at a small place called Tamworth, which is about the centre of England. Uh, <coughs> there, the father, her father, had meanwhile been cut off from his, uh, from his family, the Marcus of Lothian, and he started a perfumery business at Maidenhead. Well, <clears throat> there, there must have been some trouble at, uh, at Tamworth because she, uh, they, uh, they lived there for a number of years and the, all their children were born there uh, <clears throat> for the sake of clarity, I will name them. There was, there was John, the eldest, and Marion, who died. There was Matilda, who also died. Emily, Fanny, and Selina, and Charlie, who was my grandfather. 
Lucy, who died, Nugent, Miriam, Effie, and William. Now, there must have been trouble at Tamworth because <clears throat> on the 1st of March, 19, 1873, an entry in a diary, and she starts, they were terribly religious, these people. She starts out with a text, James, the first chapter, first chapter, verse 5. Apply to God for wisdom to teach and help us to hear our trial, to bear our trial. I have had but a few trials, but these have been sharp and sudden. The death of my dear mother, the dismissal from Tamworth, leaving home, and my dear father, the death of my children. But I see now that God does all things well. Well, <clears throat> the, the Reverend Dorrington must have been dismissed from Tamworth, and he went to the London Missionary Society in a, and uh, <clears throat> asked to be sent out to South Africa. Of course, this is in the, all in the first diary. I'm just uh, describing this from here, sir. And <clears throat> they were appointed to the church at Fort Balfour. <clears throat> During that time at uh, Somerset East, they must have met a, a professor and Mrs. Kidd, whose daughter married a Le Pen. And uh, the story goes that this Le Pen was a speculator in the district and he was very fond of the ladies. He came home one night and uh, his wife accused him of this and he out of his shambuck and he thrashed her to death. And he was eventually brought to trial at Somerset East and condemned to death. And the story goes that he used his money, he was quite a well-to-do man, to bribe the warder there and they uh, filled a coffin with stones and lead, carried it out and he was at large. Well, after they reached Fort Beaufort, uh, Mrs. Dorrington's father died and the perfumery business was sold and with her portion of the inheritance, they built the manse in Durban Street, Fort Beaufort. I think Mr. Lawford will know that quite well. It's just opposite the, the church itself. It, uh, it's a double-story building from facing the street, and there's a long <coughs> line of rooms, there must be about 13 or 14 stretching down towards the river, and in addition there was a small cottage there. That was built for the simple reason that uh, the minister's stipend at that time was 80 pounds a year, and that was far too small to bring up a family of 11 children, and they had to get down to teaching. Mrs. Dorrington taught the girls, and uh, <clears throat> grandfather taught the boys. <clears throat> most of them, were well, most of the pupils uh, lived in the old house with the, the old people and I believe that uh, pencils were very difficult to op be uh, obtained at that time so she hit on the idea that the, the tea chests that arrived from England I suppose or India were lined with lead and she melted down this lead, put them into reeds, put the molten lead into the reeds and so used the, uh, the lead as, as pencils in that way. Uh, most of the boarding fees were paid in kind. I paid them with uh, mealy, mealy bags of mealies and potatoes and anything, anything of that nature. Uh, at that time they were friendly with a, a Mr. Mallet who had a store in Fort Beaufort. He was afterwards moved to Queenstown, very well known in that town. And it was from Mr. Mallet's shop that the axe was stolen that started the War of the Axe. There were many English regiments stationed there at the time in Fort Beaufort. <clears throat> they were sent from India and Far East, China, as a kind of a rescue in South Africa before they were sent back to England. Now the officer's mess was uh, <clears throat> where the present museum is now and uh, in those days the water furrows were full of water. Well, <clears throat> it was uh, recorded that uh, these officers used to have uh, dined very well in the evenings and uh, especially uh, the, the end of the meal was always rounded off with walnuts. Then the shells were taken and fashioned into small boats and they would put these boats 
on the water furrows and lay bets to see whose boat would reach the, in front of the man's, the man's first. And I can imagine my great grandfather and great man peeping out the curtains and saying, Good gracious, just look at those wicked fellows gambling. <laughs> <coughs> well, my, my grandfather, Charles, <coughs> got to know these officers and uh, soldiers very well, and he decided that he would like to be an officer as well. In fact, his whole life was taken up with military. He was a born soldier from, from that time onwards until he died. <coughs> so he applied for a commission and uh, it was all arranged. Uh, I accepted him and he went to his father. Incidentally, he told me once that he, he respected his father but he never loved him. He was too much of a stern man. Well, his father just simply said he just couldn't afford to pay a hundred pounds for this commission and he must put him out, put the idea clean out of his head. So he, <coughs> he joined the Standard Bank at King Williamstown with his tail between his legs. Uh, the soldiers <coughs> at that time used to march up from Port Elizabeth. Uh, first the old regiment who was being relieved would leave the, and say the, the day, uh, on that day, and then on the following morning you could expect the other regiment to arrive. And my grandfather used to <coughs> bunk off without permission from his parents, of course, as that was too unseemly for the minister's son to go and watch the regiment marching in. He would <coughs> go up onto the hill, other side the bridge, and uh, watch these red coats marching in. And he said that they were absolutely fagged out. They could hardly put their, their foot, their one foot in front of the other. But as soon as they got in sight, came out the, the rise, saw Fort Beaufort, then the band would start up. And it was wonderful to see what uh, an effect the martial music had on these soldiers. They would uh, straighten up and march up into town as if they had just been for a small walk. <coughs> these regiments that came from the far east often brought uh, various sorts of epidemics with them. And uh, grandmother mentions in her diaries that the troops were dying like flies. And <coughs> of course they stuck the inhabitants of Fort Beaufort on as well. However, it was customary for the band at every funeral to play the funeral march down to the cemetery. And then on the way back they would play something gay again. However, it, uh, the funerals became so fast and furious that the O.C. stopped it because it depressed the sick. Uh, <laughs> uh, there is a tombstone in, in the Fort Beaufort Cerem, uh, Cemetery which, uh, which has got this inscription on it. Stationed here by death, we are quartered to remain, but when the last bugle sounds, we will rise and march again. Uh, she also mentions the string fellows, I believe they had a printing press in Fort Beaufort. Uh, <coughs> When we go over to Beaufort, uh, I think you will see in the museum there, there's a shell. Now that shell used to lie on my grandfather's stoop. It was a shell fired from the Alabama uh, off the coast of Pity here. And uh, the eldest son of the Reverend and Mrs. Dorrington was the magistrate at Pity at the time. And uh, natives picked the shell up on the beach and brought it to him. So he kept it and it was handed on down to my grandfather. Well, it was just lying there on the stoop and when we were youngsters there, we used to go try and hit the cap off <laughs> with a stone or something like that, but uh, it's never exploded. It's still in the Fort Beaufort Museum. Uh, I don't know if you would uh, like me to read a few extracts from the diary itself. It may be interesting to you, but of course, to me, it's very interesting because it's family names that come out of it. Uh, she, uh, she starts off with the 1st of October 1873, she says, A young man named John Adamson, having come to this country for the benefit of his health, has accepted an invitation to spend a few weeks with us. He is, ve he is very unable to engage in any situation as yet. Today Mr. Quinn took him for a drive and he enjoyed it very much. He is not so well today. Well, evidently he found that the the climate out here wasn't doing him any 
any good, but he didn't have any means of going back to his family in England. So the, the community at Fort Beaufort uh, started a subscription. They, they raised 50 pounds, so he was taken to, to, uh, for, uh, to PE and he embarked, but unfortunately he died three days before he got to England. Then they must have had an alcoholic problem in Fort Beaufort, for she says on Sunday the 9th, we were very shocked to hear that Robert Miller died of DTs last night at 8 o'clock. <laughs> Papa had to bury them this afternoon. <laughs> then, on the 21st of October, 1873, she says, since I last wrote in my journal, I have been to Queenstown and had a very delightful journey up and down. I saw Nugent off as far off to the gold field. Now Nugent uh, started off, he, he had a few ostriches in Fort Boat, found this couldn't pay, so he heard that there was gold being discovered on the reef and he off to the gold field and from there he, well he, he walked up there and he, from there he walked to Delagoa Bay and it took him two years before he got back again but he kept on sending his brother a few pounds every now and then so she was very pleased about that. <laughs> Uh, so, oh yes, she says here yeah, on the 30th of March, uh, I received a letter from our dear young friend Adamson's sister stating that the dear youth never reached home but died on the 1st of January 1874 and was buried at sea three days sail from Southampton. Uh, that's not... And she says on the 6th, that's uh, also 1874, a, a, memoria, a mo memoria, memorable day. River rose terribly high, came up to our pop granite hedge. Then on the 7th, the river began to subside about 6 o'clock last night, but it drained all night and nearly all day. Uh, we, we took a look at the bridge, many hands employed to repair it, but it is sad to look at. Uh, fine drying weather, most of the houses are drying up. Uh, we at Beaufort suffered little in comparison with other places. I fear we shall have a great loss of life as the floods have been so general. No post till today, Grahamstown and King Post cut off. Uh, Then on the 25th, that's 1876, this is rather a sad part where her husband uh, gets taken ill and she was fetched very hurriedly from the Cowie. <coughs> he, he was uh, in bed and evidently, she says on the 30th, from this date I can only say that my precious husband gradually sank, disease congestion, congestion of the lungs. On the Friday before he, his death, he suffered much pain of heart. But that brought on a slight attack and he slept his last sleep very tender towards me and his last dying words commended me to the peculiar care of Mr. and Mrs. Tudder we shall have never never forget forget him well he was buried in the Fort Beaufort Cemetery uh, a few days later Now on the 22nd on Friday, 1878, she says here, uh, 300 soldiers came in today. Town full of soldiers, canteen full, canteens full. They are a curse in this place. <laughs> Being engaged in teaching a class of girls who are refugees. I take the employment to try and be useful while others are driven about. Thanks to our Heavenly Father, we are kept in perfect peace. A report was brought to our door yesterday that H. Ross was shot after time terrible, of terrible suspense to all, especially to dear Effie. Got a telegram to say it was not true. We must pray more for him. War is still rampant and, and hurrying our young men into, untimely, into an untimely grave. A time of great mourning all to, our, to our, all our colony. 
distressing accident to Mr. Young of Lovedale, his father in crossing at Kaha at Alice upset. The gully full, his mother and dear child, the eldest of Mrs. Rivers, drowned. What agony to the parents. I just wanted to read you the death notice. As I passed away peacefully on September the 14th, 1944, at her home in Durban Street, Fort Beaufort, Fanny Dorrington, the daughter of the Reverend and Mrs. John Dorrington, and beloved sister of Mr. Willie Dorrington. Uh, that was the, practically the last of the, that family. And uh, I remember when my mother and I once called on them, I was still a, about 10 or 12, and we went through the old house. They were very proud to show, show us all the antiques. They had wonderful antiques in the house, things that they had acquired from some from these regiments which had been stationed in Fort Beaufort. And, and uh, I remember especially a great jar about that size which they used to keep sugar in. Well, after we had finished looking at all these antiques, Mom said, uh, and Aunt Fanny, have you any more antiques to show us? So she stood there in front of us and she said, uh, no, only the one you see in front of me. <laughs> Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we've listened to a most interesting address by Mr. Dorrington, and we thank him uh, uh, very much indeed for coming along here, uh, giving up his time, and delivering uh, uh, to us this uh, excellent third uh, address. And on behalf of you all, I'd like to move a vote of thanks to Mr. M.T. Flemmer and to Mr. Uh, Dorrington for sparing their time to come here and give us such good and uh, interesting addresses.